So my name is Howie, and this talk is going to be about why you may like Scala.js. So this applies to some large number of you. This may not apply to all of you, but I will try to cover some large subset of the youth in this room so none of you will go home disappointed. So who am I? So my name is Howie. I work at Dropbox fixing legacy Python and CoffeeScript code. I work at Dropbox writing legacy Python and CoffeeScript code. One thing that's nice about Python and CoffeeScript is, is that it's often legacy even before you finish writing it, which means I'll always have a job at Dropbox. <laughs> in my free time, I do a lot of work on Scala. In particular, I'm one of the early testers and contributors for Scala.js. Um, what is Scala.js? Scala.js is a compiler that converts Scala code into equivalent executable JavaScript. So the idea is that you can write Scala, you don't need to write JavaScript, and the compiler will do all the icky work for you of turning your Scala code into JavaScript that you can run in the browser. So if you look at how this works at a very, very high level, we have our Scala files, example, thing, and main. We shove them through Scala C. It comes out as example, thing, main, and main dollar dot class, perhaps, because the object gets compiled into a main dollar. But halfway through the compilation process, we will cut in with our Scala.js plugin, which will then spit out a bunch of Scala.js IR files, SJS IR, so it's intermediate representation for Scala.js, which we can put through an optimizer, which either spits out very quickly 500 to KB JavaScript blobs, which you can test locally but get produced very quickly, or you could spend a bit more time, put it through the Google Closure Compiler, which is a very well-known open source JavaScript optimizer that spits out uh, 100 kilobyte at minimum, one megabyte if you have a really huge Scala.js application, JavaScript blob, also for you to run in the browser. So putting it through GCC takes a bit more time, but you end up with smaller, a smaller application, so you generally only do this before you put this code on the internet for people to run, and not during development. So just to show you Scala.js and what it does, let's go to a live demo. So over here, I have a small Scala.js application, one of the examples, and if you look at the code, it is basically a bunch of Scala. I import a few things. I have an object with a main method. In this case, the main method takes some parameter. It's not, it's not an array of strings. I grab a rendering context. I make, take the corners of a triangle, and I run this little algorithm that keeps putting points on the rendering context. So I calculate where I want my next point to go to. I get a reasonable color. I set the fill style and I make a one by one rectangle. So I run this every 50 milliseconds and each, each run I run it 10x. And this renders a Stripinski triangle. So it's quite a cute, somewhat well known algorithm for rendering a pretty Stripinski triangle, except here with color. So over here you'll notice you have these two JS export things. And the JS exports are the only things in your Scala.js application that are visible to the outside world. Nothing else in your Scala.js application can be called from JavaScript because they could be optimized away. But the things which are JS exported, in this case Scala.js example and main, can and in this case are called from JavaScript. So if I look at the actual HTML page that gets rendered here, it lives over here. And you'll see that I am calling example.scala.js example.main and passing in a uh, canvas element, gotten using the normal JavaScript API for getting elements on a page. So this is roughly how a Scala.js application looks like. And when you look at the source, the output code, as I refresh this so, I, so you see how big it is, the example fastop.js is about 470 kilobytes. And if we look at what it looks like, example fastop is a bunch of really verbose, but still somewhat readable JavaScript. So You'll see there's a huge amount of stuff in here, but um, this method here in, in the JavaScript, it's a JavaScript method defined in standard prototype way. Um, I can't see where the prototype is because it's too verbose. But anyway, there's a prototype somewhere in this method, and it corresponds roughly to this run call here. So you'll see that we have a for loop in the run call over here. This for loop has become a while loop because we have inlined it. Um, we have a bunch of temporary math here, which is represented by these temporary variables here, which much more of a both function calls, but the structure of the application is the same. And in the end, we call fill style and fill rect 
and we call it with the x and the y positions of the point that we are given. So that's roughly how it works, and let's see it in action. So I've set it up such that you can make live modifications to this thing. Where is my console? That's not the console I want. Um, let's go back to console. So I could change this to gray, and we should see it reload. I set that send SVT logs, logs them to the browser. Let's turn it black. And let's do interesting, can do interesting things with this. For example, um, Open Weather Map, which is a website which lets you see the weather for free because it's open, has an API. And Open Weather Map's API lets you say, what is the weather? And because it's API, it lets you get back the weather in XML because that's how things are. Or JSON, if you want JSON. So let's look at the JSON API. Um, la, la, la. So what, what's interesting about Open Weather Map is that it lets you search for things. So for example, I can put in this URL which says find query equals London, and it'll give me any cities which have the name that looks like London. Let's see if my internet works. If my internet does not work, I'll have to find a new demo. Here it is, internet works. And so you have Londonary, you have London, you have another London, you have a London borough of Harrow. Um, you can turn this to XM, into JSON, in which case it will be easier for us to work with. And you can take this URL and you can use it from Scala.js, like you can use any other URL like you use any URL from JavaScript. So there's a helper for Scala.js which lets you make Ajax calls more easily rather than using dom.xml HTTP request. For now, let's just get rid of this. And let's say, let's get rid of this too. And let's say um, val URL equals this. Um, let's break it up so it doesn't run off the edge of the screen. And let's say, Extensions or Ajax URL. Does this do what I want? Um, why is it complaining? URL data string. So no data. Oh no, that's that's wrong. I need to do Ajax .get. And let's say I want to. So this returns me. Uh, this returns me a future of a XML HTTP request. So I can take this future and I can for each take the XHR, and let's say I want to print out XHR dot. Um, so these are all JavaScript, JavaScript types, sorry, properties of a JavaScript type, JavaScript properties of a JavaScript type. And let's say I want its response text. And let's just do this. What's it complaining about? I need the execution context. So let us import, let's copy and paste this thing, because that's how it works. Ah, go away, okay, never mind. Uh, concurrent dot, um, what was it? Execution context dot implicit dot global. Go. Stop complaining. Okay, so now when it runs, we will see that we have a bunch of data in JSON about the city of London. Um, we can parse it because JavaScript lets you parse JSON. So let's say parsed equals JS dot, so JSON dot parse. So let's print out the parse thing. Let's use, um, let us use dom.xml, sorry, what do I want to do? dom.console.log on the parsed. So this gives it, enough, gives it to us a nice format. And let's look at what we get back from Open Weather Map. This is being cut off. Let me move this a bit to the right. Hum, hum, hum. There we go. So we get back an object. It has a list value, the list, list property. List is a list of objects. In JavaScript, objects, dictionaries, maps, they're all the same. Everything is just a bundle of keys and values. So we can easily say, um, I want bits of this object in order to do things with. So I want, let's say I want the lat and long of the city that we are looking at the weather at, and the temperature. The temperature should be somewhere in here. I think it's in main. And here we are, temperature in kelvins. So let's say I want well, that equals parsed. So I think, so I need to get parsed.list dot for each because parsed.list is a array. Um, let's say I call it an element, I don't know. And it's of type js.dynamic because I haven't told it what it is yet. I'm just parsing it from JSON. Um, and I want to print out element.quad.dot 
that I'm to print out element.core.long and I want to print out um, element.main.temperature. So element.main.temp. Temp, yes, that's right, that's temp. So compile, compile. Undefined is not a function. Mm, that's not very helpful. So you see you, this failure in async exception is going to be familiar from any of you who know Scala and use futures. Undefined is not a function. It's going to be very familiar to any of you who've used JavaScript before because JavaScript likes telling you not very useful error messages. Let's look at what's, let's look at what's not working. So we have parsed this object. We have taken the list. Sorry, we have taken the list. Oh, I think in JavaScript it's not for each. You have to call map or something because for each is a Scala thing. Aha, here we go. So 54 latitude, undefined longitude, L L-O-N, there we go, okay. So now we have reasonable numbers, hooray. Okay, so this is how you make um, AJAX request using, JavaScript, using Scala JS. And like any JavaScript application, Scala JS can do anything that the browser can do. It can make AJAX requests, you can go to the internet, come back, web sockets, you can talk to Canvas, like I showed you earlier with the um, Sapinski triangle. So let's take a look at doing stuff on the Canvas, which is here, but it is invisible because I removed the clear method. So let's put back the clear, which fills the Canvas with a black rectangle. And <clears throat> let's do things. So what can we do with this data we have now? We can, well, first let's make the canvas bigger. So canvas.width equals dom.width, inner width, let's say inner width, and canvas.height equals dom.inner height. So one thing that's very interesting about Scala.js is that unlike JavaScript, working with Scala.js, even working with JavaScript APIs like the DOM, you get autocomplete in the editor, and you also get documentation in the edi editor, in case you didn't know what inner width or inner height was, you don't remember what the, what the height was called, but you would type it in and you can see what, what's available. So this is one thing that makes Scala.js pretty fun to use. You get the editor to help you. So let's make this bigger. Um, that did not make it bigger. Oh, because this thing needs to be, let's feel like as big as it can. That's how, that's how you do it, cool. Um, so now it's bigger. So let's start plotting things on screen. So how do we convert, let's convert the latitude and longitude to the x and y positions on the canvas and start plotting them. So I believe longitude is, so longitude is left and right, latitude is up and down, so x equals longitude. If you look at this, it's still of type js.dynamic because we took it from an untyped json blob and we haven't told Scala what it is yet. So let's cast it to type as instance of double because we, we know that it's a double. Um, and let's say y is going to be the latitude as instance of double. Um, and let's just put this l.main.tem here so I don't forget it. So compile, compile, compile. That should not have done anything. Um, let's try to normalize things. So longitude and latitude are interesting because this is from negative 180 to 180. And this one comes from negative 90 to 90. So we need to somehow convert these, two, these numbers to fit on the canvas. So the obvious way to do that is to take, let's, let's do this, call, give this a bad name, lon plus 180, val lat 2 equals lat plus 90. So this goes from 0 to 360, if I'm not mistaken. So let's take this, divide by 360, um, and then times canvas dot width, that should be right. And then this one should be latitude plus 90 divided by 180 times canvas dot height. So we should have some positions. We still haven't done anything with them. We can print them out if we think they're interesting. Long two, lat two. Um, and yeah, that looks reasonable. And we can say um, context dot Let's make, let's make them white for now. White context.fillrect um, lon is x, so lon2 minus, let's say we make them four wide. Four, four. So we run this and we have some dots on screen. 
So this is not very helpful. Um, one thing that's interesting is that we found out that London is in the bottom of the screen, and most people here should know that London is in the northern hemisphere, not the southern, and that's because in JavaScript and most graphics land, the zero is in the top and not at the bottom, so let's revert that, reverse that. So let's do latitude equals canvas dot height minus that. So now London's at the top of the screen, and now we can start getting data. So now we have a way of getting some data from um, getting some data from Open Weather Map. How do you get more data from Open Weather Map? Well, one way to do it is to start scraping it. So I can tell you as a prior knowledge that Open Weather Map does not allow queries shorter than three characters in their search API. So that seems like not a problem to us. We can just generate all possible three character queries and scrape it. So um, <laughs> queries is equal to four. Um, what, are, what are the alphabets? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V. <laughs> Let's call this the first one. For A, B, C, yield, A, B, C. So these are all the queries. If any of you want to do the math, it's only like 10,000 or 20,000 or something. It's not a huge number because it's only three characters. So um, now we can say, let's move this thing into a function. So def get stuff. And let's make it take the query as a string. Wrong. So like that. Let's move all this stuff into get stuff. Let's do that. Um, IntelliJ decided to reformat my stuff suddenly. Um, and let's do dollar $query. Um, OK, so how do we make, iterate through all of these? Well, we'll have, we'll have a loop. So let's do it manually, start from zero. Um, so one thing that's interesting about JavaScript is that if you have a while true loop, this will block the UI and the whole browser will freeze until the while true loop finishes because JavaScript is single-threaded. So we have, to be, we, have to be, we have to be a bit more clever here. So we need to create an event. So let's do a set timeout. And let's set it to 50 milliseconds. And let's say I want to get stuff queries, I, let's just do that because in case it blows up because you wait too long. So what's wrong with this code? Get stuff. get stuff. I didn't need to ask you because the compiler will tell me, which is quite cute. Um, so get stuff, and what happened? I haven't incremented i yet. So that's just randomly i plus equals 1 here, somewhere here. Doesn't really matter where. Compiler's complaining, this needs to be up here. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. So um, let's see, what's wrong with this? I'm setting a timeout. So what I actually want is set interval. So that will make it happen over and over. So now you can see it's slowly building up uh, points of all the cities in the world. So who here knows where we are right now in this picture? Well, we are somewhere over here because this is the United States, this is California, this big cluster of dots here is probably Europe, this big cluster here is India. You know, South America, middle of the Amazon forest has not much da weather data. Inner Mongolia has no weather data. Heart of Africa has no weather data, not much. So this is quite cute because I've built this in the last 10 minutes or so and it's basically an API driven map of the world using Scala.js and it kind of give, gives you a sense of what working with Scala.js is like. You know, things have types, working with JavaScript is acceptable. If you look at what here is a, let's delete a bunch of this stuff and then we can talk about it more usefully. Gone, gone. So everything which starts with HTML um, or any, anything which starts with HTML dot, DOM dot or JS dot is a JavaScript foreign function call. So one thing that's cool is that it's pretty seamless. Like you can't even tell that these are JavaScript calls because it looks just like a Scala call. But if you look at json.parse as an example, it's a stub. But it's a very nice stub with types. In this case, it's, it's dynamic. But if, for example, we look at, um, let's look at something more, more interesting. Let's look at canvas, no. Let's look at dom.inner height. This is also a stub. It's a stub which returns an integer. It's a stub which returns an integer with documentation because 
sometime many months ago, one person sat down and copy pasted all the documentation from the internet into our stubs. And as a result, all of us in Scala.js now have documentation in the editor, which is pretty nice compared to flipping back and forth between an, an, your editor and the Mozilla developer network, which is this MDN thing where the docs came from originally. So that's what Scala.js is like to use. And you might notice it works pretty seamlessly, like the JavaScript, you don't even know, you, you don't even know it's JavaScript. I can't believe it's not JavaScript. It looks just the same. The calls back and forth are the same, except it's type checked and it's, it has, edit, and it has tool, tool support in the editor. Your ID experience is really pleasant. You have autocomplete, you have documentation, you have types that make sure you don't do stupid things. And the compiled executable is reasonable size. So here I'm still using the, okay, let's, let's shut this guy up a bit because it's making huge amounts of network requests and I can't see the original download. So here I'm using the fast optimized version which is 477 kilobytes. But if I change my command to say, I want the fully optimized version, full, go. It'll turn a bit because SBT takes a long time to load and now it's starting to optimize through the Google Closure compiler. So as you see, this takes a bit longer because, and that's why we don't do it all the time. Well, a bit longer means three seconds longer, which is not bad. And when we're done, let's say I go to the, one, the, the page which loads the fully optimized version, you'll see that index opt is now 95 kilobytes. So it's actually pretty reasonable size for you to deploy on a website. Like if you look at a normal Scala JVM application, you're looking at six megabytes of the standard library plus all your own code. Whereas for Scala JS, you magic cut it all down into a very small self-contained executable. So back to the original question, why should I care? For why I meaning you and meaning all of you. And of course it depends on who, who is I that is meant to care about this. So who am I? So let's consider a few cases. If I am a Scala dev who works on web applications, if I am a Scala de developer who has never written a web application or never touched one, or I am a compiler writer who likes doing fancy optimizations, why should I care about this stuff? Well, I'm gonna ignore other cases, not because Scala.js is not useful, but because I'm gonna run out of time. So no JavaScript developer sales pitch, no CTO sales pitch, no professor sales pitch, just these three on top. So in the first case, I am a Scala developer who works on web applications. So how many of you are there here? So all of you guys are Scala developers who work on web applications. So this is for you, and the rest of you can go for a toilet break, maybe. <laughs> So I'm a Scala developer who sometimes, work on web, who sometimes works on web applications. Why should I care about Scala.js? Um, so what is a web application? A web ap ap application usually is a client-server model. It's usually written in two or more languages. For many of you, it's gonna be Scala and JavaScript. For me, it's Python and, and CoffeeScript because I work at Dropbox. But in general, it's always the same because it's always complicated. And it's complicated because in a web application, you have, you have your database somewhere, you have your server somewhere, you have your browser somewhere, more than one server, more than one browser, lots of arrows going between them because browsers can hit different servers and <clears throat> generally, there's a lot more arrows than you find in many desktop client or local applications. So what's wrong with web applications? As you can see the next header peeping, peeking up from below. So there are a number of problems you often find. One is you don't have code reuse. So, Finding two sets of libraries to do the same thing, mustache JS versus mustache Java, maybe okay. Learning two languages, maybe okay. I like learning. Writing your algorithms twice and debugging the same bugs twice, kind of annoying. I have done this at Dropbox in Python and CoffeeScript and it's no fun at all debugging the same thing which you've already written because Python decided that all numbers are uh, integers, whereas JavaScript decided all numbers are doubles. Um, alternative to writing all your al algorithms twice is you, do what's called API first design, put all your logic on the server, and the client RPC over with a 200 millisecond long RPC to get the server to do the work, just as a replacement for writing all your code twice. So this works in that you do not write your code twice, but now your code is full of these 200 millisecond long RPCs, and 200 milliseconds adds up to several seconds very quickly. What else is wrong with web, with web applications? Everything's a string or map of strings to strings, URLs, AJAX, everything is a string. The compiler cannot help you. Who knows what's wrong with the first line here? LD, okay, smart. Who knows what's wrong with the second line? 
Yes, that's correct. Elements is plural. I have caught these bugs at Dropbox before, so these are not theoretical considerations. Who knows what's wrong with the third line? It's error, that's right. Exception is Java. JavaScript has no error. So these are things that I have caught at Dropbox, and the, co the compiler does not help you in JavaScript because you have no compiler. Um, and when you're writing two languages, it's very easy to think, oh, so I'm going to throw an exception. And the code reviewer will be like, oh, yeah, he's throwing an exception. But in JavaScript, there are no exceptions. <laughs> so last thing that's wrong with web applications, JavaScript. This behavior is well-defined. This behavior is still stupid, inexcusable. So if you look at web application, it looks like this. In the end, you kind of space it out into zones that look like this. Your database, maybe it's kind of safe. If you're using Postgres, you get nice um, type assertions. If you're using something like Slick or some other fancy ORM, you get reasonable type checking. Your server, written in Scala, type checked, Scala Z, very safe. Your browser, JavaScript, not so safe. <laughs> your Ajax layer generally comprises strings and more strings, even less safe than the JavaScript that runs in the browser. So, Scala.js, the pitch is that it lets you write your web application in one language. That's not JavaScript, very important. It lets you swap the stringly typed code for strongly typed code in the browser, which is important. You already have it on the server. I don't, but you guys probably do. And in between, in the Ajax layer, which is often even more fragile. So Scala.js is not JavaScript. Mapping a list of strings on pass in gives you a list of integers of the string values. Scala.js is type safe, so unlike JavaScript, which tells you undefined is not a function, Scala.js tells you get element by LD is not a member of document. In a compile error, before you ran your code. So Scala.js also re reduces boilerplate by quite a lot in that this is how you often make Ajax calls in JavaScript. At Dropbox, you use CoffeeScript. It looks like that. Not sure if then you can tell the difference. Not much. With Scala.js, it looks like that. So I, have, I want to make an Ajax call to the API method list, I'm going to pass in the value of this, I'm going to call it. So already this is a lot less code than this. And what's interesting is when you look at this, what, not what you can do, but what you cannot do. So just to fully type this, Ajax call returns a future. In this case, I'm going to say a list method returns a sequence of strings. This is arbitrary. Let's say I mistype list, compilation error. Let's say I mistyped, I had extra argument. Maybe I got confused, I was tired, I read the wrong documentation. Compilation error, a good compilation error too, too many arguments. Let's say I tried to use it as a sequence rather than a future of sequence of string. Compilation error. In comparison, if you had done any of this typos to this code here, you'd have to wait until runtime to hope that your test suite catches it. Whereas with Scala.js, you get it even before you left your, left your editor. So Scala.js lets you roughly turn this into this. I don't know much about the database because that's a separate thing, but at least in terms of the browser and the server, and in between, which is very important, Scala.js, you cannot make a typo that will not get caught, almost. Like, you, can still make, you can still do bad things in strings. You can still call the wrong method entirely, and it's correct if the actual method will run, but you can't make dumb mistakes like this without it being caught by the compiler. So I like this quote a lot, but in the end, what Scala.js gives you as a web developer is a um, greatly reduced adrenaline usage during your work day. So Otto Crohn's is now one of the contributors who hangs out a lot on the Gitter channel. And if you guys want to learn about Scala.js, you guys can come hang out too. So those are for people who work on web apps. Who here has never touched a web application in terms of working on one? A few people never touch a web application. So why should the three of you care about Scala.js? <laughs> so I'm. Let's say I've never touched a web application. What's wrong with Scala JVM? I've been using it for a while. It seems very type safe and very fast and very reactive. Everyone knows reactive is good. Um, so let's consider a case study. Let's say I made a thing. And I'm a developer. I wrote some code. I want to send you the code to watch it run. How do I do that? So this is a real story. And possible things include I made a game that you can play. I made a ray tracer that you can look at pretty. How do I let people run it? Do I do this? Hey, anyone, want to try my game? Download this jar file and run java.jar. In fact, these instructions are wrong. Who knows what's wrong with these instructions? Dash jar, yes. So no one's going to run it. And <clears throat> to the rest of the world, no one knows what java jars terminals are. They're going to wonder where's the game. And 
that limits the number of people who can run your game to like 0.1% of the population, maybe less, which is very sad. Um, the end result is that you stop making fun things, you take a job at a big company, you live in the command line, you forget that programming is fun, you start persuading yourself that the command line is actually cool because it's black and white. Actually, it's not just Stockholm Syndrome. And this is partly the story of my life. So, I actually made this game when I was in high school, and if any of you want to come to this URL and download it and swap the dot .jar for dash .jar, you'll find this game is at that URL, but none of you are going to do it because it's annoying. So, <clears throat> what if you could just say, go to this URL and play the game? Anyone can click on the URL. Lots of people who have no idea what programming is can click on URLs. Um, so, if you compare the two, what Scala.js does is that it basically lets your Scala code run at places where it had never run before. So you can make pretty things that other people can see and not just like talk about abstractly. And so if you want to write a ray tracer, here I have a ray tracer. Poof, it's a ray tracer. Let's reload it to make it bigger. Um, let's say I want to change the positioning of this spiral because I don't like a spiral. I can do that right here, right now. So where's my position of spiral? I think it's, I think it's this guy. So let's make it go 0.5 run. So this isn't compiling in the browser, there's a backend server compiling it. But I could easily take this thing, run it, change the spiral, save it. Anyone else can see that, oh look, there's a spiral, I changed it. And go at Twitter and go look at, hey guys, I made a thing. <laughs> and tweet it. And how many people do you think will look at this? More than zero. More people than will download the jar that I showed you earlier. So, that, that's the sales pitch for the people who have never worked on web application and why web applications are cool. You would not have been able to do that using Java Swing or Java AWT or, GW, or GTK or other things, at least not as easily. But with Scala.js, you can, and it's really cool. So, the last case is I'm a Scala developer who work, who, I'm not a Scala developer who works on web apps or other things. I'm a compiler writer. I like compilers. They're cool. They're hardcore. Um, I like doing optimizations. Why should I care about Scala.js? Um, so the long story short is that Scala.js is actually very fun to compile. It may sound strange, but it is way more static than Scala.jvm, easier to optimize than Scala.jvm, and this is even more so when compa compared to other compiled to JavaScript languages. So as a static di discipline that Scala.js enforces, if you thought Scala was static, Scala.js Scala says that no separate compilation, everything has to be present for you to, comp to produce an output JavaScript executable. No reflection. Reflection makes it hard to optimize things, we just banned it. You can't use a bunch of libraries that use reflection, no ACA, no Scala test. We have some replacements, and it works generally just as well. No stack trace in introspection are unsafe. So, nope, 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 you can't do any of these things. Who does these things on a day-to-day -day basis? So, one of you. So the answer is that you actually don't need to do these things. You're not actually giving up that much. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, in Scala.js, you have to manually mark everything with JS export, which means that everything else is up for grabs by the optimizer. Classes, methods, variables, lambdas, all can be removed, except for the stuff that's JS exported because I need to call it from JavaScript. So, Scala JVM, you have slow for loops. And if you look at it, why we have slow for loops? I can't remove for each because for each is defined in the Scala stand library. So what if I compile against a, I run it against a separate Scala stand library, then it won't work. What if someone calls dollar count dollar one using reflection? Well, I have to support that, so I can't remove it. Blah blah blah. Well, so nothing can be inline, nothing can in, 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 be eliminated. But Scala JS, happily, because we threw away that one person in that corner, we can do a lot more. <laughs> So Scala.js has had fast, fast for loops since 2014, and this literally compiles down to this. I don't know what the extra count variable is, but it's still pretty fast, much faster than calling a lambda. <laughs> and this is literally the code which gets spat out by Scala.js optimizer before the Google Closure compiler then takes over and does even more optimizations to it. So in terms of concrete output, this means that Scala.js runs a lot, sorry, Scala JVM generally runs slower than Java, generally. Like, you could argue how much. If your Rex Cur is 0.9 times as slow. If your Ami is about 5 to 10 times as slow. Generally, it's probably some number slower. And you can write in Java style and make it faster, but then you're giving up a bunch of Scala stuff to write it in a bunch of while loops and mutable state. 
and you get a seven megabyte hello world, your 400 kilobytes of class files plus a six megabyte standard library. Never mind the JVM. So <coughs> Scala.js runs about one X as fast as normal JavaScript. We are as fast as normal JavaScript despite all of Scala's craft. All I can build from and all that rubbish gets stripped out by the optimizer and it runs really fast. And the final executable is about 100 kilobytes, which is a lot smaller than seven megabytes. And it's actually feasible to deploy, download the Scala.js application, run it in Chrome. So just like I didn't count the JVM, I'm not counting Chrome. But download the Scala.js application and run it immediately without having to download a bunch of libraries. So this is what optimization looks like. This is what it was before. And it's, even in Scala.js's case, it starts off like this. And this is what, what, what it ends up as. So other languages in Scala have e even harder to compile to JavaScript. So for example, Opal is a Ruby to JavaScript compiler that is even more mature than Scala.js. This is the equivalent method. It compiles onto this Ruby, maybe annoying and uh, hard to read. Notable, the plus is now a method call. Why is plus a method call? Who knows why plus is a method call? Yeah, someone may monkey patch it, that's correct. I may run half your program, change plus to mean minus, and run the other half, and you're meant to keep the behavior the same because you're Ruby. So this is why other languages have problems. So rather than five times slower than Java, Opal is actually 100x slower than raw JavaScript, which is really slow. And if you look at the thread linked here, you can optimize it, but you lose semantics, like the ability to change plus to minus halfway through your program. It turns out that Ruby and Python and other programmers often use these semantics, and that's why it causes it causes Opal problems because I can throw away one person and get really fast optimizations. They would have to throw away half the community and to get equivalent things. So like for example, in Python, you, there, there are about six different Python to JavaScript compilers all along the range of how many people they throw away and how fat they are. On one end, it supports almost the whole of Python, six megabyte executable. On the other end, it supports very little of Python, few hundred kilobyte executable. In the end, they're all bad trade-offs. I don't want to give up anything and I want it to be fast and very small. But for Python and other languages, you can't. ClojureScript gave up vars, which let you monkey patch top-level variables and classes and functions at runtime because you're too expensive. Give up eval because it's too expensive. Dart, if you read the linked thread, I will send out the slides later. Dart, if you Google for Dart reflection file size, you'll find that using reflection in Dart makes your file size about 20 to 50x larger than if you did not use reflection because of all the extra data you have to keep around and the things you cannot optimize. So the long story short is that dynamic features are expensive to use, to, to implement. And just because you have it on the server where you don't mind downloading 500 megabytes of JAR files each time you run your code, doesn't mean that you should keep them around. And Scala.js, because you're forced to, we have dropped them. So in general, Scala.js gives you a well-specified language with specified semantics. If any of you have Googled for Scala spec and found bugs, try Googling for Ruby spec or Python spec and see what you find. Um, the, and the semantics are much stricter than Scala JVM, so much more static, no reflection, all that stuff is gone, much easier to work with. And there's tons of opportunity for inter interesting work. So like Martin Odersky thinks type trees are cool, but we got them even before they were cool. And they are great. <laughs> so fun things you can do with Scala JS. You can remove the Turing completeness from your compiled Scala.js application via binary instrumentation, 30 lines of code of regexes. Much easier than trying to do the same in, on the JVM bytecode. I have done the same in JVM bytecode. It takes about 2,000 lines of Java using the ASM library. In Scala.js, it's about 30 lines of regex. JRebel style live reloading, 200 lines of regexes. It's a lot of regexes, but it's not a lot of code in, in overall. So, <laughs> this is not quite true, but I thought maybe. So Scala.js overall is many things to many different people. To a web engineer, it is a breath of safety to let you calm down and stop panicking whenever you push something. To a Scala JVM only programmer, Scala.js lets you get out of the command line that you've been using for the last like 10 years and get on the internet where everything is wild and open source and standards based and prettier. Um, to a compiler writer, Scala.js is an easily approachable compilation target. You can easily say, I know, this is, I know this cannot happen, I will optimize it. I know that cannot happen, I will optimize it. After doing that a bit, you end up with a really cool 
optimization pipeline and really small optimized code that you just cannot do with Scala JVM given the constraints. It doesn't matter how smart you are, the constraints are very difficult to work around. So that's what Scala JS is to a bunch of people, and I'll take questions. Anyone? Come down to the mic. I'll just yell, I'll echo it. You can interact with them, and this is way echoey, more echoey. So I will show you how interaction works. So I can say js.dynamic.global.json.parse. Um, so what this says is I'm going to call these global objects or global functions. I can replace this here, and it will, it will behave identically. What you don't get for this is you don't get type checking. So you can always interact with things dynamically. In this case, you get no help. If you screw up, good luck to you. Undefined is not a function, thanks. Or you could write facades. So interacting with third-party libraries is no different from interacting with the DOM standard library. The DOM standard library, in fact, is just another jar that we include in the, on the class path. So, you write a specification, this is misleading, this is actually js.object, if you look here, it's not actually just object, it's not Java lang object. And this basically is an assertion that such a method exists in JavaScript, and you can write a whole bunch of them and become quite strongly typed. Example, let's look at, this is a game I made, it is quite fun. This is all made using Scala.js, about 2,000 lines of code. Um, where did the physics come from? Did I implement a physics library in 2,000 lines of code? I did not, because it's really hard to make it stable. What I did was I used a third-party physics engine called chipmunk.js. And chipmunk.js exposes functions. So you look at the source code, a lot, lot of functions, all the physics stuff. In Scala, if you want to interact with this, again, you can use an untyped API. What I did was I ended up writing facades. So a facade is what I showed you earlier, just a untyped, sorry, it's just a typed binding, so you can call it and get checked. It doesn't actually check the actual JavaScript because you can't, but at least if you promise it's like that and you do it wrongly, it will tell you. So writing these facades is how you make your life better. There exist facades for Angular, React.js, Paper.js, a bunch of other things. People tend to write their own, but a few of them have been shared. So if you look at Scala.js React, that's one of the more well-used React.js facades, and lots of documentation, amazing. So, you know, this is actually a thing. You can use third-party libraries. Um, David Barry's using it for stuff, and other people have, have used it for things, and it's actually workable. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so the question is, why did I not say, dump the JVM, use Chrome for everything? And the answer is, um, the JVM is a lot faster than JavaScript. So JavaScript is web scale really fast because it's 5x faster than Python. Wow. But 5x faster than Python means about 10x slower than Java. So um, V8 is very fast, not compared to JVM. Um, other things include, we haven't managed to get a compiler running in JavaScript. I don't know if anyone's working on that. We have the optimizer running in JavaScript, which is quite a complex piece of software. We don't have, we don't have a Scala C compiler running, so we can't do it, even if we wanted to. And then SBT and all that, good luck persuading them to use Node.js for everything. Yeah? Question? Yep. You do have concurrency. You have concurrency and you have no parallelism. Example, let's say I wanted to do these things five in parallel. I could take this and I could, sorry, I could take this and I could copy and paste this five times and I would have concurrency. It would make five requests 
it would, all of them would come back, and you could, if you want, you could use future join to wait for them to come back. You could use future await. What you don't have is parallelism, but things like AJAX requests can happen concurrently. And you have different, so over here, I use a global execution context. Again, you can define your own execution context. But remember, you only have one thread, so it doesn't get, get that interesting. Um, questions? Uh, workbench is a thing that automatically lets you auto reload the browser, and it is a thing which lets you see the log SBT log spam. Okay, this is wrong. Right? It's a thing which lets you see the SBT log spam in the browser. Um, so if you don't use Workbench, it's the same. Well, actually, this page does not have Workbench. If you don't use Workbench, it's the same. It's just you have to reload it manually. Um, workbench. SVT log spam in console, auto refresh browser, that's it. Yeah. Question. What do you think about um, I think it's great. Um, I don't think it goes as far as many people here would like. So TypeScript solves all the problem, almost all the problems of JavaScript being weakly typed. It does not solve the problems of JavaScript being verbose because TypeScript itself is quite verbose. It does not solve the problem of we know better ways of doing these things and we can't do it. So TypeScript is like JavaScript minus the bad, but without plus the good. So for example, as an example, just to make that more concrete, I want to make five AJAX requests in Scala.js, make AJAX. And I want to wait for them all to finish before I make the next five AJAX requests. So I do this and I can say, sorry, so I will say, where is my, where does my thing end? My thing ends here, so it's actually be here. So I can say val requests equals seek make ajax. And I can say for, um, I can do scala.concurrent.future.join, is, is it join? Sequence requests dot for each do stuff with it. So this is stuff that is cool, you can't do in TypeScript because even though TypeScript gives you strong types, it does not give you cool abstractions and the types aren't as strong. So there are many things you can do like this in Scala.js you cannot do in TypeScript and that's why it's nicer. Oh, and one other thing I found that people have told me, TypeScript does not have an incremental compiler. So many of you may think SPT's incremental compiler is slow, but writing, writing incremental compiler in the first place is a huge amount of work. And many other languages do not have incremental compilers despite having slow compilers. And someone told me that working on a large code base in TypeScript is slower than working on a large code base in Scala.js because even though the Scala compiler is slow, at least it's incremental. Whereas the TypeScript compiler is not. And you know, you end up waiting for the whole thing to compile each time. So that's another thing. We have a lot better tooling, not just Scala compiler, but all the ecosystem, and that's nice. Any other questions? Uh, here. How's the performance on immutable collections like vector and map? Um, honestly, we never measured it. I can tell you a rough order of magnitude. Scala JS is about five to 10x slower than Scala JVM. Actually, I don't need to tell you that. Let me go and do a benchmark now. So this will give us an answer in about 30, 60 seconds. In the meantime, anyone else want to know things? Oh uh, yeah, you get source maps. I didn't show them to you. Um, so if you look at, yeah, fastobjs.map. So if you, get, if you see a stack trace, there's a stack trace in the browser. I think it's that. Wrong. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so some things are, at Dropbox we use require.js a lot. Require.js is inherently a non-whole uh, non program approach. Um, we would need to swap over to something like common.js in order to have the whole program optimizer that would play well with Scala.js. Um, so for example, 
Require JS likes putting down packages one by one or in bundles. Scala JS, the minimum, minimum bundle size is 100 KB, and you have 20, 100 KB bundles, it adds up really fast, and you can't really do that. Second is that no one at Dropbox knows what Scala is, so it's a tough sell. Um, apart from that, that's mostly it. So you look at how mature Scala JS is, and it's not super mature, but you look at how mature CoffeeScript or JavaScript is, and it's not great either. So I, I honestly think it's more or less ready to use, but I've, I haven't tried pushing it at work yet because we have other priorities in the immediate future. Um, so let's, re let's remember this number. 1,300,000. Let's look at the JavaScript number. It's, it's producing it now. Um, One million three hundred thousand versus two hundred thousand. So this uses a bunch of mutable collections. It's a templating library, so there's a whole bunch of different things. So it's not immutable collection in particular, but it is an immutable-ish. Temp it is a mutable templating library. Um, it looks like it's about five x slow down from Scala JVM. Not bad. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, how would you go about testing generating JavaScript or how do you test in general? Um, so two options. One is JavaScript programmers don't test, so you don't. <laughs> Another is you so I, I, I just ran unit tests in one of my projects here. You see this is a unit test being run on the on inside Node.js. These are the unit tests being run inside J Jada, J Java 8, JVM. They, they look the same, and they should look the same, except this one is faster, and this one has additional tests for JavaScript-specific functionality. So we run these tests on either Rhino, Node.js, PhantomJS. Phantom is if you want the DOM. DOM access. Rhino is really slow, but if you're too lazy to install the other two, it'll do until you install the other two and get frustrated. Um, but you, you, you use a testing library. Scala test does not work because, as I said, it uses reflection and other crazy things that only JVM uses. I wrote my own library called Microtest. It's like 1,000 lines of code. It gives you relatively good output. So if we look at, for example, um, let's, look at, let's look at unit test code because it's cool. Source, test, Scala, Scala tags. Uh, Test, text, basic test. That's not cool. Um, text tests. So, sorry, I have no syntax. I think I don't use it very much. But yeah, you define a test suite. Test suite has test snippets inside. Um, you assert things, and if you do something bad, it gives you a red line in the test output. What's interesting that I, of the thing I just showed you, basic test, what is this? This is a stub which lets, this, is, this inherits from a more generic test suite, so if you really want to, you can share your tests between Scala JVM and Scala JS using inheritance, or even if they're slightly different, or even using the exact same source code if they're exactly the same. So I showed you a whole bunch of tests. Many of them are duplicate between JVM and JS, and those, are, and those all live in Scala tags shared. Yeah, so these, so these are all the shared tests. And then there's a whole bunch of JVM or JS specific tests. For example, I think um, JS specific tests live in JS, source, tests. So here we have a smaller number of JavaScript specific tests. So testing, if you want to, you can open up a HTML page and get Jasmine results. In practice, most people just run things in the command line and see whether it spits out red at them. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Do I still have time for questions? Out of time? Okay, cool, thank you.